So the question is, are drones with camera tilting servos the best? Welcome back to Striking FPV R&D. My name's Ashton and this is my Mambazing Veyron 35CR pusher with a head tilting servo and a naked GoPro Hero 8. That's a lot to digest, so let me explain. So the Veyron 35CR pusher is a drone designed by HGLRC and as its name suggests, it's a pusher configuration, 3.5 inch prop, Cinewoop Cinerace, CR Cinerace. It's not dissimilar to the GEPRC Cinelog 35 that everybody else uses. So why didn't I go for that instead? Well, there are a few reasons why I didn't use a Cinelog, and basically the main one was I wanted to use the existing hardware that I had in my old Cloud 149 frame, which was basically a diatone Mamba stack. And the Veyron can actually take a stack, whereas the Cinelog requires an AIO. In the event of a crash, the Veyron 35 actually has separate prop guards, which means if I snap one, I only need to replace the one. Whereas on the Cinelog, they actually have a single piece for all of them, and that means I either have to replace the whole assembly, or make do with glue. I'd also seen some videos from Captain Drone, Justin from Drone Camps RC, My On High, they all noted that this thing seems to cut through the air better, it flies a bit more aggressively, and considering I'd only semi-recently lost my freestyle drone, I figured if I'm gonna have one, I may as well have a Cinewoop that can kind of pull double duty, slow, indoors, but also be able to race outdoors somewhat. The last two things I'll mention about the Veyron and why I chose it is it has a lot more space under the hood, at least that's what I saw online. So compared to the Cinelog using the AIO, everything looks a bit more crammed, maybe less modifiable. So Veyron made a lot of sense in that regard. And finally, everybody has a Cinelog. Seriously, everybody. Like, I haven't seen many Veyron reviews online, just the three, I think, and a couple builds maybe. But the Cinelog's kind of everywhere, and I'm sure for good reason, but for me, I kind of like to root for the underdog, and again, I'm pulling double duty, freestyle, Cinewoop kind of stuff on this, so it made a lot more sense for me to go with this. Now, I mentioned earlier that the Veyron takes a stack, and that's a mini stack, whereas I was trying to put in a full-size stack, and I've succeeded. What I ended up doing was designing two little pieces that adapted the holes existing on the frame to then be able to hold the stack that I happen to have. And it seems to be working well. The only real downside to that is the fact that the Vista, the air unit light or whatever you want to call it, is directly below the stack. And if I didn't have to adapt it, the stack would probably have a bit more gap between the two, whereas now they're really quite close. So if you're concerned about cooling for the air unit light, the Vista, that might be something worth thinking about. But I, I assume because everything's so close to the props and there's going to be so much turbulence in there, cooling wise, probably okay. But like, ideally, if you were going to build it, get yourself a mini stack. I think in the future, I'll do the same. Now, the benefit of using the older hardware was that, you know, the F722 flight controller has an onboard barometer. And that means I can plug in a GPS with a compass and load up iNav. Why iNav? Well, let's just say that the loss of my last drone is because of a not so ideal return to home situation. And I kind of like the idea of having a flight controller that doesn't choke on slightly abnormal fail-safe conditions. So iNav is, you know, perfect for that. The added benefit as well is now I have access to a couple other flight modes such as altitude hold, position hold, and I can just flip the return home switch whenever I feel like it. So that's kind of cool. The one downside to using iNav is that resource mapping is not a thing. So when you're going to do servo control in Betaflight, you'd be able to choose one of the spare pins that you're not using, for example, UART6, and you can tell the software through the CLI that you want to use that as a servo output. And then you can configure it that way, and it just works. iNav, not so easy. Basically, iNav has to be specifically configured when you build the target. So in my case, the target for the Mamba flight controller did not have any servo, that's a lie. Two of the motor outputs can be used as servos, except I have four motors, so that's not an option. Now I ended up digging in the target code and you know getting everything to compile, difficult-ish on my computer for whatever reason. I am a former programmer, so I'm a little bit versed in doing this stuff, but either way, I found it quite difficult. I had to try many, many different combinations 
And I couldn't get UART 6 or 5 or 4 or any of them to work as a server output. In the end, though, I managed to get the LED control pin. So if you wanted to use addressable LEDs with this, well, I can't now because my LED control is the servo control. Now, maybe there will be a way to fix that up in the future, but for now, I've got it working and I don't need LED control, so it's fine. But if I do upgrade to, for example, some of the newer Mamba stacks that actually have eight motor control pins, I could use one of the spare four as servo and then I'd have the LED control free. But we'll get into that later and flight controls are expensive at the moment. So the main feature is how does the servo tilting work? Well, basically I hopped into Fusion 360, my favorite design software of choice. I have tutorials, by the way, on designing stuff in that, so check out in the top right corner. Uh, but basically I hopped in there and I took measurements of the GoPro, I took measurements of the Cadex, it's a polar camera in this case, and knowing the design of the frame, I did a little bit of design of the frame so that I could kind of model around it. I made this framework where the GoPro and the Cadex camera are actually in the same kind of holder, printed out of PETG, whereas the rest of the gear is actually printed out of TPU for durability and bounciness. The little electronic thing on top of the servo is actually a 5 volt BEC from Matek, Matek Sys. And there's an important reason why you'd want to do this. Basically, I could power the servo directly from the 5 volt of the flight controller, but if for whatever reason the servo jammed and suddenly started drawing way too much current than it should, there's a possibility it could fry the BEC on the flight controller and then I lose the flight controller and the whole thing falls out of the sky. No bueno. The other benefit of having a separate supply is that you basically guarantee that the supply is smooth. If you have voltage fluctuations, there's a potential it could cause jittering when the servo is moving and you definitely don't want jittering when the servo is actually moving the camera. But seriously you ask, what's up with the camera tilting thing? Well, last year I actually had this idea already when I first built my Cloud 149. I just thought it made sense because if you had a servo and a tilting camera, then you could say fly really fast by doing the camera like this. And then if you need to slow down, you just tilt it forward. And in some cases you could even fly backwards like that in the same shot. I actually experienced this because when I was uh, flying the Bensley suite, I'll link up to it in the top corner, in that shot, I actually start off at the beach, I then turn towards the trees, I fly through the trees, and then into kind of a villa sort of situation over there. And that shot only worked because there was a sea breeze to blow the drone in there. I actually had the camera set pretty much zero degrees. And the sea breeze is what launched me in inside. And then once I got inside, the breeze kind of stopped. So I was able to fly nice and slow through there. But what if I wanted to fly out again? And the sea breeze is blowing towards me. Then guess what happens? I've then got to angle the drone like this to really get out there. And now I'm staring at the ground. So it's kind of difficult. A tilting camera would solve this issue. Basically high angle for fast forward flight fighting furious winds, a flat angle for low slow methodical flow, and a negative angle if you want to stare down at the peasants or wonder if you're going to hit something behind you. So that concept bumped around in my head for a long while, but a day job and other monetary priorities basically meant wouldn't come to fruition until about a couple months ago. But last year, someone already managed to do this and with a full-size GoPro. And that someone was Josh Medlin from Medlin Drone. Go check out his website. Now, he's really cool because he's actually made all that information available on his website for free. So if you've got a budget to keep and you like tinkering yourself, then you can go to his page and he's done all the research and he's given you all the materials there. So you could just, you know, start ordering your stuff and off you go. You'd have a working prototype. But if you do want to support him and the effort that he's put into creating that resource, then you can also buy directly from him. I'm not sponsored by him or anything. I just think he's done a really cool thing and we should thank him for it. Plus, he's got a YouTube channel. So check that out as well. It's funny, actually, last year as well, he, when he started posting about that stuff, I remember seeing it. I was like, oh my God, he's doing the thing. Now, we actually had an interesting discussion in one of his posts on Facebook, where basically it's all about servo choice. So with his full-size GoPro, he found that the best servo to use was a robotics-grade servo. And that's because the robotics servos are a lot smoother than other ones. And that's kind of crucial when you're moving a camera assembly. And the same thing goes for Naked GoPro. When I first started doing this, I ordered this absolutely tiny little servo 
from t interwebs, AliExpress actually. And I got two of them because I figured, you know, some of these things might break. And this thing, very cute, very lightweight, does the job, but really, really jittery, like so like jerky going back and forth. And so I thought temporarily, you know, maybe, maybe I need to use a larger servo. So I grabbed this and this thing is basically salvaged from one of the, uh, the wreckages of an old RC plane that I have in my back room. And this thing was smoother, I think by virtue of the fact it has a bit more power, but it still had a slight jitter to it. And you can maybe listen. Ah, it sounds kind of crunchy. So in the end, I discovered this. This is an MG90S. And basically, if you search for a full metal or metal gear servo, full metal, full metal jacket, no. If you search for a metal gear servo on the internet, this will be one of them that pops up. And I believe they're made by multiple manufacturers. But the crucial thing is to try and find one that is actually full metal. Some of the earlier models of these, I don't know if you can still get them, actually have one nylon gear at the bottom. Whereas this one that I have is completely metal. And it even has a brass bushing at the top where the actual output arm kind of sticks out. And you can kind of hear, this is a little bit smoother to turn. I'm probably not supposed to do this. One thing I will say, if you were to do this yourself, is uh, basically grab a screwdriver, take the four screws out, and the top pops off quite readily. There is grease inside from factory, but not that much, and I feel like it could benefit from having more. So I had some red grease from my motorcycle projects lying around, and I just put that in there, put the lid back on, and so now I can even see the red grease. And it feels a little bit smoother as a result. I highly recommend doing that because even if it doesn't do much, at least it means that the metal isn't going to grind down. If you've put all that grease in there, it'll, it'll definitely help. There's only one real caveat to using the servo on my particular setup. If anybody's seen my older videos, I list the gear that I use. I actually fly with Express LRS and currently on 2.0. The reason why that's important is because Express LRS gives you full stick resolution. And then depending on the mode that you choose, hybrid or wide, you basically get a lower resolution on all the other aux channels. So that means the channel that I use for the slider is actually only 7-bit resolution, which means there are effectively 128 positions, positions available to control the servo. Now, if the servo is a 90-degree servo, that means I have 0.7 degrees of resolution, which should be enough, but like if you had a wider servo, let's say you had an 180 degree servo or even more, 270, then you might want to change that. But luckily, the actual arm on this, you can kind of change the ratio of its control by choosing a different position on the arm compared to the receiving arm. So there's a little bit of leeway there, but something to think about if you're running Express LRS. I don't know much about other control links, but if they offer aux channels at full resolution, then obviously this won't be an issue for you. Now, in terms of controlling it, I actually have a TX16S. You might have seen this in my uh, battery comparison video. And it's got a nifty little slider over here. So I've set this slider up to be the actual control. And that means if I don't want to use head tracking and I just want to set it and forget it, or even set it like once or twice during the flight, then I can just kind of wiggle on that. But if I do want to use head tracking, basically we have a trainer port over here for a 3.5 mil audio jack. And that will then plug into, drum roll please. This is my DJI FPV goggles. And if you notice, it's got this big box on the side. And basically this is a nifty little setup, I think. What I've done on this little box so this box actually bolts directly to the screws that hold the, the side goggle things. And it's got a little piece of uh, double-sided tape to kind of hold it nicely there. On the front, we've got a button. That's the reset button. On the back, we have a micro USB port for programming. And then we've also got, this is power out. So what I actually do is I plug in the power for the goggles. I plug into my head tracker. Power from the head tracker out then goes into the goggles here. And that way, my head tracker is using the same power supply as the goggles. And before you get worried that, you know, if something fries in there, this is basically a parallel connection, but it's direct pass through. So if the head tracker, for whatever reason, fails, 
the power should still probably get to the goggles, in which case I'm not foreseeing a sudden blackout. Either way, I'm running iNav, so return home is pretty, pretty reliable. And the final thing, which you can already see because it's there, this is the 3.5 mil jack on the bottom side of this. So basically I plug in an audio port there, plug the other into the TX16S, and I have the trainer set up to override the little slider on the side. And that means if this is plugged in, I can use my head tilt to control the camera tilt. And if I unplug it, then it immediately goes back to the slider control on the TX16S. And because I know the internet is so trusting, I suppose I better actually demonstrate it working. So here is drone. Here's my other hand. And then basically if I put the goggles on awkwardly like this, oh man, that's weird. I can then press the reset button, which sets this as my level. And then if I look up, oh man, that's so weird. Look down again. Oh, trippiness. Unplug this before the air unit gets too hot. Ah, uh, telemetry lost. And the one thing I don't think I mentioned yet, uh, the case for the head tracker was designed by yours truly. And I'm not gonna make that available just yet because the case itself, it looks kind of neat, but it's held together by like one long screw and I think some silicon, which is not ideal. The Brains is an Arduino BL Sense. And the reason why that was chosen was because it has an onboard IMU. So it's kind of a all in one little chewing gum, stick of chewing gum that you can use to do the project. Now the actual software is open source. It's available on, what is it, headtracker.gitbook.io. And it includes a very convenient program, which does the programming for you. So you don't have to download like the Arduino IDE or anything. You don't need to know how to code, pretty straightforward. And I'm not gonna get into the details of that. I'm not even gonna bother making a video because the best video I think so far is by a guy named Painless360. He has a fantastic video where he shows you how it's built and how to program it and configure it. So go check that out up in the top right corner. So two things I forgot to mention about the specs of this drone. I mentioned the name was Mambazing Veyron 35, blah, blah, blah. So Zing, I'm using basically the motors off of ProTech 35. The reason for that is because my old Cloud 149, which is a three inch drone, I had plans to convert it to a 3.5 inch because I thought larger props slightly more efficient, which is true. Um, but the 1408 motors on that from before, definitely a bit too small, even for three inch to some degree. So I thought ProTech motors, that makes a lot of sense. They're 2203.5s. And the cool thing about them compared to other 2203.5 motors is that these come in a 12 by 12 M2 mounting configuration which fits a lot of smaller drones. Whereas other 2203.5 motors from other manufacturers are usually going 16 by 16 M3. So like the Roma F5, which is currently sitting at the bottom of the lake. Oh, tear runs down my eye. The only other thing I forgot to mention is the GoPro. I actually chose the iFlight GoPro case because it's TPU. And TPU, as you know, is a bit flexible, and I figure that will probably survive a crash a little bit better than the GEPRC version. The GEPRC naked case is actually injection molded, and if you were to crash, you'll definitely snap something and then glue and icky, or you have to buy a new case, and I figured this would be a better option. In fact, I have actually had this drone tumble a couple times in the grass due to some configuration errors, now, I haven't yet flown into a wall at 60 kilometers an hour, but if I ever do, I'll let you know how it survives. Now, that's enough tech talk. Uh, it would be a little bit weird for me to do an entire video on a head tracking drone and then not actually fly it to demonstrate its use cases. So I can't fly now because the weather looks like it's going to go really bad. We actually had really bad flooding last week, but uh, when I get the opportunity, I'll head out to a field and I will show you. So now you get to listen to some... Faux girl from Ipanema music. Oh, welcome to the sports field here at uh, where? It's sort of the, the Nyharn windmill viewpoint kind of area. It overlooks Nyharn down on that side, which is beautiful. Uh, in the evenings, I know some people come to play football and they seem to have set up like this croquet thing going on, which is kind of cool. But I'm here in the early afternoon because this is where we're going to test this guy. Anyway, let's get to it.
door for a table. How's that for convenience? All right, here we go. First flight, we'll have the camera angle high. And we'll see how we go. So fast forward flight using a high angle. Allows us to do this kind of thing. But of course, if we want to slow down and level out, I'm now staring at the sky. If I want to fly backwards, well, I'm even staring at the sky even more. So that's kind of silly. So let's try flattening it. This is our flatter angle. So now I can fly a bit slower, orbit around our little football thing, no problem. Easy enough to do. The wind is pushing me a touch. But of course, if I want to fly fast, I'm now staring at the ground. Finally, if I want to fly backwards, I aim the camera down which is great for flying backwards. But now if I need to fly forwards, I'm like pointing the camera straight down, which is kind of silly. And that's our situation at the moment. So let's high angle and get back to us, and we'll plug in the head tracking system. But even this, I can angle my camera down for landing. Which is super convenient. Now, we're gonna try plugging this in. Where is it? There's the 3.5 mil jack. And then, like I mentioned, it's the trainer input on the TX16S, so there we go. And it's working. All right, so, goggles back on. Press the reset button, level my head. There we go. All right, where are we at? Pre-arm and arm. Let's do this. Oh, the wind doesn't want me here. All right, so let's fly fast by angling up. Not bad, said Dad. Now let's say I want to fly a bit slower. Angle my head down. Not bad, not bad, not bad. Let's fly fast again. Head up. It takes a bit of getting used to, I tell you what. It works though. And now let's say I want to fly backward. Look down. Whoa, how weird is that? Oh man, that's so, that's so strange. I don't know how I feel about this. Flying backwards. Oh man. Let's go forwards again. You can actually see in the DVR, because the FPV camera is so low, when I look straight down, I get the yellow foam bumpers in the shot. Let's do that again. Let's say I want to fly really high. And look down a bit. Hey, look at that. So I can maintain my position here and look at the view. Wow. Of course, I'm really tempted to turn my head left and right, but that doesn't do anything. <laughs> but yeah, so now if I want to look at the sky a bit, look up, look down, look up. The wind really is pushing me, but look at that view. Isn't that beautiful? Nyharn Beach, absolutely gorgeous. Let's switch to acro mode and see how that does. Wait. All right, we're diving down. Nice. Let's say I'm in acro mode and I want to slow down, head down. There we go. What voltage am I at? 3.68. <laughs> so low speed maneuvers in angle mode. Fly backwards in angle mode. Oh man, that's so strange. <laughs> and my voice changes because I'm crushing my, uh, crushing my voice box. Let's go forward again. Yeah, man. <laughs> How trippy is this? Oh, this is so cool. And now, let's get back to where we need to be. Switch back to, uh, back to angle mode. Wow, the wind is really fighting. I wonder how uh, the nav modes do here. They do pretty well. Bad. <laughs> INAV. 
<laughs> not too bad at all. Well, I think I've proven my point. So the benefits of a head tracking servo. I can see them, but it's not the easiest to fly. That's literally the first time that I've properly used it and definitely will take some work. A couple other things I should mention as well. My system, because of the way I've designed it, it only tilts like 10 to 15 degrees up. Uh, so if I move the pivot point slightly further out and move the servo back a little bit, then I'd get a bit more throw. And I think I would like to do that in the future. But for now, that's pretty cool. It works pretty well. So I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with that. But yeah, I mean, I think that benefits are pretty obvious in this case. I was able to fly and midway through the flight, change the camera angle for the purposes of demonstration. Once I actually put the head tracking in, well then I don't really need to think about it. I was able to just fly around and that's a lie. I did have to think about it. But I think that's a matter of practice. If you look at Josh's videos, he's been doing it for a while and he's getting quite good at it. This is literally my first time properly flying out in a field. It's an uh, eye-opening experience, you could say. Uh, other things, you could add roll. In fact, Josh has already done this to his drones, and for his case, I see it making some sense. So spitting another servo onto this system, probably not going to be that practical, and probably won't be worth it either, considering I plan to use this kind of for indoor reshoots, so tilting my head sideways to compensate for the wind blowing us sideways or for an orbit, maybe not that important. And the other thing is this, in the FPV airplane world, so they put like a FPV camera in the cockpit and then you can look around inside the cockpit of like a fighter jet or something. And that, that's really cool. And now that I think about it, I've got another idea for the head tracker but that'll be for the next video. Anyway, to wrap up, I'd like to thank everybody for watching, especially if you came in from the other videos that I did, especially that video series recently about the Chelong Reservoir flight, as in pre-flight, the editing, as well as the 3D text. Uh, that took a lot of work, but the response and feedback from that has been really, really nice. And I mentioned cheekily in the last video to try and, you know, maybe get over 500 subscribers. And I'm happy to say that I've actually achieved that. And that's thanks to you guys over on Facebook, over on YouTube, that kind of thing. So thank you very much. Uh, to wrap up this video, click like if you liked it. Uh, comments, you know, questions if you want to know more about this system, you know, down below. Of course, in the description, I'll have links to Josh's website as well as a few other things. And of course, subscribe if you dig content like this because I'm gonna be trying to make as much as I can before I get busy again. So anyway, thanks again, and we'll see you in the next video.